I'm, uh, no, I'm no, so... no. That, those sorts of apologies should be reserved for the people who made the Dark Shadows documentary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been hearing it's bad. <laughs> um, you know, God, God love them. They're, they're fine people, but uh, it's, it's kind of tepid and it's kind of boring and mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it just doesn't tell me anything new, and I, I don't think that's because I have, you know, a, mm -hmm. you know, I've studied this a lot. Right. It's um, it just seems to be a little lacking in, in insight, uh, about sort of what made Dan Curtis tick. And have you seen it? No, I haven't. <laughs> I, I've been reading. I've been reading a couple of reviews, and I've heard that it's like the. The the word so far has just been a resounding no thanks. Like, yeah, I yeah, and I, you know, I mean, I feel like a traitor to the uniform saying that <laughs> because, you know, I mean, you wanna you wanna say nice things about the motherland mm -hmm. and all of that, but mm -hmm. um oh oh lord, I mean I had I mean I have narcolepsy, <laughs> it didn't help. Um, and, and that's the that's another thing is that there's so there's so little new Dark Shadow stuff beyond the big finish. Well, stuff. here's here's the thing, there could be, mm -hmm. there could be. I mean, you know, um, uh, there's a really good book by a guy named Tom Shales called Life from New York. That's yes, a, I have it. You know the book. book. It's an oral history of Saturday Night mm -hmm. Live. Yes, sir. And and it was done at a time and and by a group of people who weren't worried about mm -hmm. you know selling something. And I think the fact that this was produced by MPI Home Video didn't help because it feels mm -hmm. like kind of an ad for Dark Shadows, but. The issue is that we've already bought Dark Shadows. <laughs> right, yeah. You we're know, already in the tent. Like, you're not going to... Yeah, I mean, you know, you could tell us that Dan Curtis had the skeletons of six-year-olds in his closet, <laughs> and we would still... We'd probably buy it more. Yeah, you know? exactly. That and, would add, add to the kitsch factor of it. And now yet, it has the whole true crime element. Like, <laughs> and yet, here we are, and it's kind of the same old stories. <clears throat> it would get right on the verge of new mm -hmm. stuff. It goes mm -hmm. right there. And then I feel like it would pull back. And and that that was a shame. At the Paley Center, there was a wildly uncomfortable moment on stage. <laughs> oh, oh no, it was really, really, really uncomfortable. <laughs> and and I understand why, because it was not the proper place or time to ask this question, but somebody asked so how would Dan Curtis fare in the era of Me Too? <laughs> and you have, and you have three of the actresses on the show who are captive on stage, mm -hmm. and and I, my heart broke because it was just such an uncomfortable question. Yeah, it just sucked the air out of the room. Like my skin crawled as soon as you finished it. <laughs> and yet, and yet, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, if it is a salient part of that story, it, no, it's not appropriate to trap people on stage and ask them that question. Uh, exactly. However, in, in, you know, depending on what the documentary is going to be, because there's always a question of, well, is the documentary going to be just straight, just the facts journalism, or is it going to be interpretive, or is it going to have an agenda, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't necessarily know that it should have gone there. Uh, but I feel like for such a a guy who sends people out of his office throwing up because he is so intimidating, that's not a cute story. Exactly. And and that story has been treated as and that Dan was so intense. Some writers would well, I want to know what on earth was going on with those writers. Mm -hmm. And moreover, what made the people who were loyal to him loyal? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you how did you escape that treatment? Because apparently Roger Davis uh, just just made hay all over the set. The guy went the guy went nuts. Mm -hmm. And other than actresses kind of stepping on his toe when he would upstage him and, and things like that, 
apparently Dan just went all oh, that Roger as you know he like upstaged other performers allegedly and got in the camera lines and you know played played practical jokes slipped in scripts from Strange Storm or whatever <laughs> 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 did only pages from Marilyn Ross novels or, or whatnot in, <laughs> into the into the scripts or you know short sheeted Magda's bed or something like that. Uh -huh. um, uh, took pictures of Thayer and David in that machine with the 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 band that went across Fat Man and then just kind of shook yes. it back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did the, the did he and David equipment. Ford get in those machines facing each other and did they turn them on and then did they play to, try to try to play Jenga? Or something. I want you to imagine that. I want you. That's a whole episode right there. No, God. I just like. I, oh, I'm so disappointed that people are so disappointed with it because I was I was genuinely excited about it just as a newcomer. Like I, I was like, oh, now I finally have this this like I, I have like the last waltz of Dark Shadows and, that I can watch. And that's the thing is that for people who don't know the show and haven't seen all of the interviews on the MPI stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it might be good. But, you know, if you've got a documentary called Master of Dark Shadows, it, it, unfortunately, it couldn't figure out which it was going to be more of. Was it going to be more about the Master, or was it going to be more about Dark Shadows? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's some of the Dark Shadows stuff, I feel like there's got to be a little more depth to be going into. And we got a little bit. But, uh, but then on the other side... Um, is it going to be about Dan Curtis? Because it skips over stuff like the Night Stalker and Dracula oh, really fast. That's insane. Really, to me. really, really fast. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm down with a documentary on Dan Curtis, and I'm down with a documentary on um, on Dark Shadows. But I, I feel like maybe it could have had a little more focus on one or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's and more whoopee. There's Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> She's in it. There's Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg's in it. Oh my God! Just as like a talking head, like yeah. She's a Dark Shadows. Yeah, fan? as a talking head, talking about. Uh, she's in the trailer for it too. Um, oh God. So, uh, so we also there, there was also another question Paley Center about uh, whether or not there was going to be sort of Dark Shadows reboot action. Mm -hmm. And right. I, 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 a very non-committal answer. Very non-committal answer. So right. I, I don't know. It is MPI. MPI is the only people that have licensing rights to Dark Shadows in in terms of like physical media, right? No. Well, you got Big no. Finish. They're doing the audio well, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Warner, I just like Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers has it really, gotcha. really, really hot and heavy. And if you've seen the pilot to the 2004 series, and if you've seen the 2012 movie. You know what a great job they've done so far. They really yeah, know how yeah, to handle their property. They've really done a bang up job. They've really been doing right by the by the IP. Yes. Uh, and I actually I like I like that the two thousand one one. But the, it, I wait, I don't think it's like amazing. The, but the I, pilot? I, wait, the two thousand four pilot? Yes. Uh you know, I, I don't have a lot of problems with it. I like how they handle the character of Willie. Mm -hmm. You gotta be careful that you don't say I like how they handle Willie. Um, <laughs> uh, but but all seriousness aside. Uh, I like how they did that. I like the casting, although Alec Newman is a tough uh, is a tough sell on this. Yeah, and it's so weird that he's like he's found this odd orbit around. Like I, he's always been the the Quizak cataract in in my opinion. He was the, he was the guy that that was my Paul when I really started getting hot and heavy into Dune yeah. in my high in my in my high school years. Yeah. So like the, the the weird orbit that he's found around Dark Shadows like really delights me that he was that he he started in this pilot and has now become a pretty integral part of like the big finish verse and he's like turning in a really great performance. Well he's a too. good actor. He's a, he's a good actor. And you know my my challenge with him as Barnabas is that you know, with with both uh, with both Alec Newman and Ben Cross, in the <coughs> in the revisions of Barnabas, I think they keep wanting to play him as suave and sexy, mm -hmm. and so on. And his sexiness 
in the TV series, in the, in the original TV series, TV series came, came from the fact that people wanted to mother him, that he had this mm -hmm. tremendously yes. wounded quality. You know, it, with, it, it's a very Sinatra-like performance because, you know, he could have moments of swagger, but a lot of it was about the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and, it's a very detective kind of thing, like like Sinatra and the Detective, where he's sure. just kind of, he's this broken man, but he still uh, has this sex appeal. No, I definitely agree with that. Like, I feel like Ben Cross and, um, and Newman kind of fall into that dark, brooding, uh, like the angel trap, if you will. Like, they, yeah. they're really, they're really trying to crowbar him into this role of... And I've never, and whenever I watch the show, I never thought of Barnabas as like a romantic lead, um, ever. And I've, I always felt like it was very odd whenever he was in um, love story arcs because it just never really clicked with me. I don't. But I, again, I, I haven't seen it, the, the whole scope of it, so I, well, the great I just part got is, until like Julia showed up. I don't think it really, it really gels for Barnabas either. And there's this sense of, am I really here? Is this really mm -hmm. happening? That happens, exactly. that happens in 1897 a lot, which is like his episode <laughs> of Fantasy Island. By the way, who, who are you? Who am I talking to? To whom am I am I casting the pod? Uh, this is, uh, I have the pleasure of talking to Mr. Justin Partridge, audio correspondent to the uh, Collinsport Historical Society. That's fabulous. And I'm Patrick McRae. Uh, uh, General Nuisance at Collins Port Historical <laughs> Society and Thorn in the Side of Wallace McBride. Uh, and uh, I hijack it several times a week, ostensibly five times a week, <laughs> with the Dark <laughs> Honestly, Shadows, with the dark just, shadows table. Uh, very, just very sincerely, I, you've done, as, as Gaff said in Blade Runner, you've done a man's job, sir. Thank the you. fact that you've been doing this for so long and so well is like it is is a, is a marvel to me. I, I I'm honestly I'm so so happy to be talking to you. Thank like you I feel like much. I'm in the presence of a master. Thank you. That's that's a that's a real pleasure. You know the the, the greatest curse of the Dark Shadows Day book was that that in my own opinion after a few years they, they started getting good, and I and I started <laughs> and I started recognizing that, and I realized oh my God good is so much work, it's so much more work than <laughs> adequate. And so now each day book takes me two or three hours mm -hmm. to do. I mean, it's an essay, and, right? Um, and so, uh, and so, I really, I really appreciate the praise. I wish I could get more of them out, but I feel like I have a, a high enough standard well, uh, yeah, of the good ones uh, I now. Said, I said on Twitter, and I genuinely mean this: like the Dark Shadows Day Book is now the great American novel, well, just for as long as it's been going on. Good like, God, it's, it's there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. <laughs> So, uh, so you're in the, the beginnings of Dark Shadows. You're up to episode 73? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, the sheriff just ruled the, the death of Bill Malloy, an accidental drowning uh -huh. uh, that, sent, that sent ripples to uh, Collinsport, uh, so much so that, that Sam Evans refused a Sunday. He couldn't even look at it. What? Because he was just... He couldn't, uh, nothing's he couldn't look nothing's going to change up in Collinwood. Wait, he could, he, he, at a Sunday? Yes. And it, yes. was that at the diner? Yes. Well, why did right. they pour bourbon on it? Uh, it was it was a sight to behold, sir. But now, yeah, I'm 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 fairly fairly. Um, I have a broad idea of well, everything that happens in the show, but I'm I'm really trying to to get in at the ground floor. I've been I've, I've actually been doing my own column uh, called the Dark Shadows Diaries. I have enjoyed it. Can, People can read me make really dumb jokes about uh, Victoria Winter's obses obsession with windows and uh, Collins, Collins Port in general's weird um, relationship with food that it seems to have. Tell me about the food relationship. I want to know about this. I, there have been, the, the, in the first stretch of episodes, there have been this, this very odd runner where the characters have like mentioned weird things about food. At one point, Bert Devlin orders a, oh gosh, what was it? He, oh no, the, the main thing that, that I found here recently, Miss Johnson was asking Maggie if her roast beef was well cooked and if her, <laughs> and if her, I wondered and if her that lettuce, myself. and if her lettuce was well washed. Like it's this, this odd, I, <laughs> <laughs> My mind is swimming with euphemism. 
I, oh. I, I just, I had to just like oh, sit. God. I had to just sit there with that dialogue for a little bit. There's another oh. Dirk thing where he ordered something with extra with some. Something with extra mayonnaise. Or well, now like there's, he, the, yeah. there's the sheriff in his in his weird relationship with mustard. Yes, yes, yes. And he went on this odd, like Eugene O'Neill rant about like how <laughs> corned beef, corned beef shouldn't be. They put too much mustard in the corned beef, and like, in what reality is this something that someone has a like a diatribe just about in the middle of a scene? It's something so odd to me that Dark I shadows. cannot stop thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, they had to fill the story up with something, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if they had a sponsor that was, you know, Libby's corned beef, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, I got a weird story that I probably shouldn't tell about oh, well, about well, Humbert Allen Estrado, about Humbert Allen Estrado and Libby's corned beef, because after I uh, after I interviewed him, um, he said name dropping. Uh, I I wanted to thank you, right? And so I went mm -hmm. to his Amazon wish list page which i looked mm -hmm. up through his email address and uh and and one of the one of the items there were only two items i won't say what the other one was but it was uh but but the but the item i will say is there was cans of libby's corned beef <laughs> the man liked libby's corned beef god bless him the great oh. demon of collinsport and his thing for libby's corned beef um, and it's just like it just adds to me. It adds so much more to the charm of the show because I'm I, I've never seen any of these early arcs at all. I, yeah. Like I've 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 just kind of heard broad strokes about it, mainly just be centered around Burke's haunted silver pin, which has finally sure. made its first appearance uh, here recently for me. Yeah. But I just like to me it adds so much more charm to the show in that like. It's just always been weird. Like you thought, you thought that it just got weird when a vampire showed up. Like no, no, no. It's always just been really, really weird, and somehow people really responded to it, and it became like this phenomenon. Uh, it delights me to no end. You know, I keep thinking about the the issue of family on the show, and how how whether this was conscious or unconscious the uh the or unconsciously because if it were really? conscious they wouldn't have been able to write it uh, uh yeah yeah the, uh that that in in dark shadows of course it centers around a family and there is always some invisible parent somewhere everybody mm -hmm. is kind of an orphan uh we don't really know what happened to jameson uh, you know, which is the father of, of Liz and Roger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an invisible mom for a while with David. There's, mm -hmm. there's an invisible dad with Carolyn. Um, it's really, I think, uh, there's, you know, Maggie's mother's missing or mm -hmm. is not in the show. You know, she's dead. Uh, we, uh, you know, vi both of Victoria's parents are missing. Wink, wink. One of them is supposed mm -hmm. to be Elizabeth. Uh, and, and it's only really when we get to Barnabas that I think, you know, Barnabas has, has two parents <laughs> that, that we get to that. And I wonder if some of that was designed to, A, that, that you're dealing with households where you've got kids coming home from school and there's probably just one parent there. I, I just, mm -hmm. I wonder where the issue of the missing parent came from because it is such a <laughs> where pattern. that became just like a, a, a TV column just like a staple it's of, a thing of on dark it's a well it's a thing on dark shadows specifically mm. I'm not sure I like I I definitely feel that it that it had to have some sort of response just in um, just for latchkey the latchkey generation definitely I feel like um, this is this may be this may be a bit too pretentious so if it is let me know oh, in the oh by all means below. tell me and I'll put it in the day <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the way that this and again this may be a little bit of a stretch but I feel like the way that um, the Mad Men episode about Dark Shadows kind of encapsulated how like lonely people or like disaffected people or people that didn't really feel like they had a family could kind of find a solace in dark shadows sure. and again that this could be me projecting no. so much because no, i'm very all. obsessed with bad men but i don't know like i just to me 
when I first when I first got into it, I was I was fairly young and I was a child of divorce and I was kind of just charmed by this weird show. But the more that I've gotten into it, the more that I've kind of really gotten the sense that it just seems to be something about disaffected people, about people that are kind of listless and lonely. And like the listless and lonely of like the fandom have really re- have really relied on that and have really responded to it. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, all of the characters are kind of loners in their own sense, and yet they mm-hmm. all come together. And then Collinwood becomes this, I think, for viewers and certainly for me, the second home. Mm-hmm. This this feeling of safety where there are familiar voices and familiar people, mm-hmm. uh, and. Um, and, and it, it really does reach out as a surrogate home. And I do think it speaks to the lonely. I said in one column, in a, in a moment of almost Ben Grimm-like self-pity, that I said, you know, I said, sports and Lord of the Rings are for people with friends. Uh, Dark Shadows, Dark Shadows is not necessarily that. Um, which, which was, I, it was so I odd when I met, when I met, offended. Offended that you nailed it so perfectly. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> because Lord of the Rings is about a group of people who all band together and you basically play in the backyard trying to get rid of, you know, a ring. Mm. And uh, it's every first Dungeons and Dragons <coughs> game you've ever played. Sure. Like it. And then sports is this thing I read about once. Uh, I don't know anything. Yeah, about yeah. It. It's, um, I feel like it's like a legend, but no, like I, I definitely have felt that. Like that. It's so it's so beautiful to kind of see like this this like melancholy kind of like meditative weird show that just like ticked all these boxes for like for things that I just I genuinely didn't even know that I wanted or needed out of a TV show or like what have you found that with any other television shows? Oh, definitely, I, he said leadingly. Um, <laughs> I. Zing. <laughs> I, I did, Star Trek. I we before before we started um, when when we first got the marching orders that that the, that the podcast was coming back. That was this was something that we first really started talking about was that we both really love Star Trek and we both kind of associate a lot of those crews with the feelings that we kind of are are dredged up whenever we think about the Collins family. Sure, and I would say Deep Space Nine probably being the closest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it even has a bar. Yes, exactly. Like yeah. It's, 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 it's the family that you've made. Like, it, it's, it's, it's these, it's these misfits and these, these antagonists that are all thrown in this one, in this one place and just told, figure it out. You're, the, like, this is what's going to happen. This is how you have to live. Like, you have to either make something of it or go insane. It is and about, you know, that, that issue of volitional family is really important because I think when speaking to the lonely, the families, for them, have to be the families that they choose. Exactly. Uh, and in Dark Shadows, you know, Julia decides to hang around. She decides, she chooses to be part exactly. of that family. Like every- you always have a room at Collinwood. Like even if you're even if you're there with like malicious intent or if you're being kind of duplicitous, like you're still gonna get a room. Like you're still gonna be able to stay in this and I feel like Deep Space Nine does the same thing really well too. Uh, like in that like there's always a place for someone on the station. There's always sure. a place for them under Cisco. Cisco would have like, had bunk beds with Gold Ducat if he had asked. Exactly. Like they even like <laughs> I, I I recently finished rewatching it, and I had completely forgotten about like that that whole arc with him and Ducat as like these this like kind of Jack Aubrey and the French kind of character dynamic that they have, and it's just so beautiful how it like it runs the entire gamut from antagonist to. Like begrudging ally. Yeah, we're looking like, like, when he's got the Klingon ship and he's, he's wearing the yes. sash and, and all and of that. That whole that whole episode where they're they're both stranded on the alien planet and Dakot's like going insane and like he's seeing all of these visions of of people that he's wronged in his life that he's trying to he's try, I think it's just right before he gets the Klingon ship, right? I, I don't remember, but they like to strand people on planets because then yeah. there was when Odo and Quark get stranded on the planet and they have to fight over who has the pants 
and who has the jacket, remember? <laughs> I wish... It's like the, the bottle episode. Yeah, Thanks. I like... wish they had done that with Ducat and Cisco. That they're fighting over a pair of pants and fighting <laughs> over a jacket. Just I... trying to hike up a mountain like the sure. time. Sure, sure. That's, that's feel... comedy. I feel like Dark Shadows really ticks that box, though, too, in that, like, it's it's a lot... A lot of characters kind of are, are thrown into, like, either... Um, at odds with each other or kind of finding themselves in unlikely alliances and then it grows into something even more enriching for both characters it, it's always something especially like the main one that i that i've experienced is just barnabas and julia oh yeah but like i'm sure there's there's so many because we even when i when i first started watching i watched the barnabas stuff and burke is just like the the wacky neighbor that kind of just like hangs out at Collinwood, and now that I'm starting at the beginning, he's the devil himself. Oh, like, it's, it's he, totally different, and yet he's kind of the hero. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's like a tragic kind of like uh, Alexander Demasian quality to him, in that like, well, yeah, let's why why not eat the rich? They're the rich. Like, I I I totally agree, um, and uh, and they have uh, they're, they're more they're more marbled with fat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's are. very lean. It's yeah. very lean cut. Is it you know, lean? I mean, David David has been force fed like a goose, so his liver will be. <laughs> well, that's what brings Nicholas Blair back, is child cannibalism. And if people get anything about our discussions of family on Dark Shadows, it is the implied threat of child cannibalism going <laughs> on at all times. And I keep telling people that. And they won't listen to um, me. I mean, you said you've said it for years, Patrick. <laughs> I don't. Since my early days with with Kovacs, when I was writing for the Kovacs show, um, <laughs> I kept uh, I kept putting that in there. Oh, um, oh Lord! But no, I I feel it's to me. Collinwood is now very much being associated with like the feelings that I that I feel when I see like the the Enterprise Bridge. Or like sure. when I see when I see quarks, like when when I see that drawing room, or when I see that foyer, like I'm really starting to get well, and like the the sentimentality increases. I think also when they go to color, because mm -hmm. it, it really changes as a show. And I like both shows. I mean, I I I'm not down with these purists who say, oh, Dark Shadows is only good when it was in black and white. It's right. Like, well. You're leaving behind, I think, over a thousand episodes or something. Yeah, so, that's like that's such a that's such a bulk of the of the series. I yeah. can't imagine not watching that. Barnabas and Julia really become friends when they get back from 1795, mm -hmm. uh, because you know I think they have to have him now interested in Vicky, so that has to be a focus of his love interest, and and I think there's only so long Julia can try to kill him or hypnotize him or whatever. And so they bring in Dr. Lang as a villain, and they bring in Adam and Nicholas Blair and Angelique as a villain, and they have no choice but to team up. Uh, right. And I just wrote about an episode where we kind of see the team up happen. Between Angelique and Barnabas? No, no, between Julia and Barnabas. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, and it's about trying to get the truth of 1795 and Peter Bradford and all of that mm -hmm. out of her. And they know mm -hmm. that it's in both their self-interest to do it. And uh, and Julie is not going to do something terrible. <laughs> and I feel like I I don't it, it could just be like the 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 extra kitsch factor of the fact that it's just like oh this is now this is we're talking about a vampire and a witch or like stuff like that but like the way that the show really kind of makes these old or these soap opera tropes sing in a way that like it doesn't really feel as wrote or does this make any sense like I, I feel like I feel like just beyond because I've watched a lot of soap operas just like vanilla regular soap operas and, and I'm, I'm a big comic book guy so I I've of course am kind of engrossed in serialized stories yeah but I just feel like I feel like Dark Shadows in particular always kind of made that stuff sing a little bit more than just like regular old betrayals or just regular old um uh, 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 like villainous so, reveals, sure. as it were. How did you come to soap operas? What are you doing watching a lot of soap operas? What's going on? There? <laughs> I I had to spend a lot of summers with my grandparents. Ah, uh, that explains. And just 
it's just on in the back and you kind of find yourself if you don't like have a book or like you don't have like your Game Boy is out of batteries you just end up watching like two hours of Days of Our Lives and like you end up getting pretty invested into it and I feel also I'm I was a weirder kid that was really obsessed with um TV structure uh-huh. and like and like serial like a lot of that stuff so I would always um I read like a lot of TV scripts and like just a lot of like because remember how they used to do those um those like compilations of X-Files scripts and yes. like Buffy scripts yes. I was like really really obsessed with those you know what I was really obsessed with was Sammy on Days of Our Lives but, but <laughs> before she lost the weight she she carried it well and that mm. Stefano Demira, what a villain what a villain what, what you take a, okay so Stefano Demira, you know Stefano yes oh, oh, Stefano of course Stefano Demira. okay so Stefano Demira, S- Stefano Demira versus uh, versus um, versus Burke Devlin who would win oh well I feel like well because Stefano's a big is a big schemer too is a oh. big plotter and a schemer too yeah so I feel I feel like hold that it's thought be, hold that thought. Hey, I'm back. There was a near fire. Uh, we almost evacuated the building, but it was a, <laughs> it was in the name of meatloaf, of which is a, a yeah. crucial thing. I hope Wallace left that in. Just the ominous silence. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, now, having said that, and uh, and I'm trying to get us to that golden half hour. Uh, the uh, the other thing I want to talk about, Mad Men. You're a Mad Men fan, yes? Yes. Oh God, yes. Okay. Now, do you know about Stinker Let Loose, or Stinker Let's I, Loose? I do not. It's an audio movie. That's a parody of. Uh, it's a parody of Smoking the Bandit. Uh huh. And it's also a book, and. Um, it's, it's by a guy named Mike Sachs, and it's amazing, but the audio version stars as this Burt Reynolds-type lumbering hero, John Hamm. Oh, my God. And he's, he's fantastic. The comedy John Hamm, I feel like, is the better John. Like, I, I lo- absolutely adored his performance of Mad Men. I think he's, I think he's great. And I've seen him in, like, in some movies, like The Town, he's very good in, and, and stuff like that. But when, when John Hamm does comedy... Yeah. There's just like a certain in another thing. Have you ever seen? It's called, um, it's like the greatest television special of all time or something. It was an Adult Swim thing, uh-huh. and it and it was John Hamm and and um, Adam Scott. Yes. And the whole thing was they were going to recreate the the um, opening title sequence of. Oh God! Now I'm just I'm losing. It's an old detective show. Is in the uh, 70s and 60s, 70s and 80s. It's two guys. Oh God! It's it's the most insane thing I've ever seen. And the, at the end of it, they do the, the title sequence. But there's this whole runner that like John Hamm got sick and died while they were filming it. And he really commits to this bit where he just has like he, like makeup effects on. And he's dying and he's listless, but then when the camera comes on, he perks up and like does. It's the most, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I cannot believe John Hamm's agent let him do it. And I, I anytime he does comedy, I'm there. Like I think it's brilliant. So, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there with bells on with this Smokey and the Bandit parody. So uh, what, what character would John Hamm have played on Dark Shadows? There you go, Wallace. I've got it back to Dark Shadows. Oh, wow. Oh man. I think That's... Elizabeth Collins Stoddard. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start it. In drag. Why not? Oh, Why not? You know, John Hamm is the secular Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> he is. Diablos I'm, is not dead. I'm, That's going to be the only trans will be in. I have a weak heart, Patrick. You can't keep doing this to me. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'd love to see his Roger. I think he would do an amazing So Roger. that's what he's calling it now. <laughs> um, having, yeah. having said that, and I doubt that I did, um, we are at the uh, we're at the thirty minute mark. 
Uh, this is a blast. We, have, we did it. We have, we, done, we have done our bit for King and Country. Now, I haven't gone back and listened to this, but, uh, but I'm sure it's a, it's a classic that will be beloved for, for generations um, uh, until the next episode, which will be even better. Uh, Justin, any, any final thoughts on a sign-off? Because I have none. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, so, I'm so I'm so glad we did this. I'm so happy people get to experience it. Um, I'm so I'm just so I'm just so happy to love Dark Shadows. It it's 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 my favorite thing. It really is. I'm I, I it it is the love of my life, and I'm glad it's there. <laughs>